So we can discuss it in uh, in the in the next ex uh, exercises. Okay, so welcome to lecture number seven, and uh, which still belongs under text classification today, but it will be a, a little bit part of text generation next week. So we're going to be talking about the first part of learning better representations of, so to say, of input in order to create a better output uh, next time. So here's a here's a little motivation. So the point is that language data, I mean, if we work with text, text is a sequence of words. So we have somehow sec sequential data or time-based data. So in time t, there's a word, time t plus one, there's another word and so on. So there is some like time progress left to write most of, you know, and, and time. So we have tokens or characters or stuff like that. So this is great. But if you, so what is MLP? Send it to check. What is MLP? It's an abbreviation of something. MLP. Okay. If you're using abbreviations, everybody has to know what, what they mean. What was that again? Yes? Multi it's multi-layer perceptron. Exactly. Multi-layer perceptron. What was that again? What is a multi-layer perceptron? Any ideas what that thing could be? So if you come back, we had this lock linear, uh, lock linear model, which was like very simple, couple of features, projection, and one sigmoid on top of that. And, but then we kind of extended that to something more deeper. So in 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 a word, in a to a network. So this is it basically. Multilayer perceptron means you have some input here. So which I show is a is a vector. So this is the input. Oops, input. And then instead of plugging everything into one dimension and run, for instance, oh, this should be a sigmoid. It's not a sigmoid. I run a sigmoid on top of that. We would do something else. We would do the input, then going to maybe fully connected next hidden layer, which is then fully connected to maybe another hidden layer and so on. And we might end up here with maybe one sigmoid or one. Okay, sigmoid is for binary classification. What's again for Multi-class classification, what was this last layer doing? There was some also some other thing there. We had the other thing. What was that? Yes? It was a softmax, exactly. So either we we said this, you know, probability of one is something like that, or probability of each class here is a probability distribution. So we had softmax. So this is a multi-layer perceptron, okay? So uh you should it should be it should become your friend. So multi-layer perceptron is a basic building block of uh, <clears throat> of neural networks. So this is what we have. So we have a but you know MLP so multi-layer perceptron. We always work with these sort of input layer which has a fixed size. Okay. So what did we do to but we we are working with sequences. You see the discrepancies. So we have sequences of text and they are they have different lengths. So you remember from the first lecture we had a movie which was you know movie review which was uh, three words or four words long, like this was a terrible movie or something like that. But you can have like, you know, two pages of movie review, but we crammed everything into one vector. So do you remember how we did that? I mean, if you, maybe it's on the, on the slide, so don't look at the slides. Um, what was, how did we cram uh, different lengths of text into a, uh, a vector of a, of a predefined dimension? What did we use? Yeah. How did we cram words into a vector? Yeah, we use back of words, exactly. So we took every word and just basically uh, throw them in the back and then say, oh, if the word occurs in the data, I'm gonna put here the number of occurrences in my in, the, in this example. So what was the, the disadvantage of back of words? I mean, back of words, uh, that, that works to some extent, but was the one of the disadvantage is that you lose, lose what in back of words? What do you lose in back of words? You, you lose the order, right? And as we've seen, like the order matters in many cases. <laughs> okay, so it was great, back of words works, but we're working with sequences and the sequence really matters. We had sequences in language modeling where we actually were interested like what comes after a sequence of words, you know, to predict the next word. All right, so we need to do something about it. So how can we deal with that? How can we turn turn into real sequences of words instead of back of words. 
well, okay, so we had this work through concatenation, so it uh, it was it could be like one idea. We had this averaging and vector addition, so continuous back of words, right? So this is one representation, or we can limit context in um, in language models. We said so. What is this Markov property? What was that again in language models? We had Markov property. What was what was that in language modeling? You know it from other contexts as well. So we said there's a Markov property. It's doing something. We have a long context, but it's too long to be modeled or estimated properly. So we said something. We made an estimation. Sorry, uh, we made an an assumption basically. So we said that using this Markov property, we're gonna do something with this very long context. Remember what was the something? Yeah. Yeah, we we just look at the previous k words. We just say, okay, we're gonna ignore everything which is bef you know before, and you know don't care about it. And we say this is completely independent. You know, the current state is de depends on only a couple of previous states, but not on the all the previous states. Which also has some issues because if you have like really long dependencies between words in your text, you're gonna run in trouble. So, what we really really so these these were some simplifications or assumptions or design choices which get you somewhere, but what you really want to work with are actually sequence of inputs and to have maybe fixed size output. So what we really want is to something like, well, if I have, you know, word one, word two, and word three, I need to cram it into my network, whatever my network is, and get maybe an output, or I have just word one, and again, I want to cram it into my network and get, get some output. So I want this architecture to take different lengths into account just by design. Okay, so that's what we're going to solve today. So we're going to really look into sequences of inputs. All right. Welcome to <laughs> Recurrent Neural Networks, or RNN. And we start with the abstraction of these, of these RNNs. So this is the... This is the the modeling approach, which are going to help us to model sequences of, of inputs. Um, and you may be thinking, OK, uh, is, it any, is it of any use somewhere outside of language? I guess you can use RNNs in any sort of time domain. Like if you do some time, time domain dependent prediction on some non-language non data as well. I don't know. I've, I've, I think I've seen people using that for stock market prediction, but I guess like generally it's a bad idea. But you can use that. Like if you have a series of some observations or features, you can do predictions of that current state. So basically, it takes the sequence into account. Okay, we're gonna use it for language. So, okay. So we are we're laying the the ground terminology here. Or just refreshing that because we are talking about it already, but just to, to make sure that we are we understand what we what we're uh, going to describe. So we have a sequence. We have a sequence of n input vectors. So it's going to be x1, uh, xn. So I'm using these bold symbols for vector, right? Right. Bold x is a vector. So we have n input vectors, um, and this is uh, one to n. So we're indexing from one to n, not in like in, in Python from zero to n minus one, but we're using a, like a. So there's there's languages that actually do uh, do index of, uh, arrays from one to n. Do you know any of those languages? Like there's weird languages that that you know if you have a first element in a vector, in in a row, in in C or in Python it's gonna be zero, but there's languages that that use one for that. R, yeah, R, and I guess uh, Matlab, and and all these friends, and it it's very confusing for some people. So if you grow up with like the first index is zero, <laughs> and you start in oh the first index is, is one uh, is one, then yeah, um, design choices. Anyway, so in programming, I mean we're gonna index from one from zero, excuse me, from zero, but here we're saying it's one to n. Okay. And the assumption is that each input vector has the same dimension d in. So d in dimension is the input vector. 
Okay, so the question is, we have n input vectors. I'm going to write them as a column vector here, but it doesn't really matter. Could be row vectors, just for sake of uh, saving space. So we have first, second, and third vector. So what these, what these vectors might be? And typically, typically, these are a word embedding of token at position one. So if I have v cat set and on 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 the mat, um, typically this will be an embedding of the word the. So where do we get the embeddings? How do we get from words to embeddings? What can we use for that? We talked about it in the last lecture quite a lot. So. There's tools how to turn a word into an embedding. Do you remember how can we do that? Or do you have any idea like uh, how can we how can we turn a word into an embedding? The simple so what, what is a simple solution? Like if I should if I give you a word and I, I'm I'm gonna ask you, give me the embedding of this word. What you're gonna what you're gonna do? So we, uh, we use uh, first the uh, one part to the vector for the word and then multiply it with the embedding matrix. You, yeah, you're take exactly. You can you say I'm gonna take this as a one hot vector and multiply with the embedding matrix. So this is already too complicated. I would just say you have the embeddings pre-trained pre somewhere. So you take like word to vec embeddings or something like that, and then you just look up the word in the matrix. It could be my multiplication if you need, you know, if you wanna do one hot. But mostly, if you do really pre-trained word embeddings, they are in a word in a in a way like a vocabulary. So you would have these embeddings somewhere. It's a, so to me, embeddings is like a uh, a storage. So you have for each word like a vocabulary. So lookup table basically. You have v, and then you know it corresponds to this vector, and then you have somewhere cat, and then you know it corresponds to this vector, and you basically look it up in this in this embedding space. That's what you can do. Alternatively, like how to do it computationally, it could be one hot encoding by the uh, by the matrix, but it do it doesn't have to be the, the case. So it could be just simply lookup. Okay. So, and these embeddings are coming from somewhere else. So, uh, how did we get the embeddings in Vertuvec? Do you remember? So where where did these embeddings come from? So we are blocking about language models, and then we're talking about pre-training word embeddings uh, from text. So how how did we get them? We we try we we learned them, right? I mean, nobody's telling like, okay, how well, this is the embedding of the word. I mean, and uh, you you you're not gonna create it by hand. That's the point. I mean, you're gonna learn it from data. So how did we learn it? Like generally, we use we use a trick or we use some sort of a, a special way, excuse me, special way of of machine learning or special kind of uh, approach to learning. So if you have learning, you have supervised learning where you have the, the labels. So did we use any labels for training uh, word embeddings? Did we use any labels for training word embeddings? Not really. Yeah, no, not really. So, oh yeah. Exactly, we used like this self-supervised. Exactly, so we had a self-supervised learning because where we just say, okay, here's the context and here's the missing word. Can you predict the word? Or we even said like, oh, here's the context. Here's a word. Is it a true word or is it some random word? That's we how we that's how we learn word embeddings. You know, so we we use this. Skip, skip gram or continuous back of words word embeddings, for example, in word to back. Okay, so this is where the embeddings come from. So this is just to kind of you know connect this with the previous lecture. Why these word embeddings are of any use? Yeah, of course. I mean, you're gonna feed them into uh, uh, recurrent neural networks, for example. Okay, but this is typically word embeddings, but it could be actually any arbitrary input. So it could be even one hot encoding of token. Like uh, you can feed in one hot. It's possible, but typically you're gonna use uh, word embedding. So the question is, okay, why is better to use word embeddings as some as input uh, as compared to one hot encoding? Because word embeddings they they have something more than one hot encoding of words. So what is what is why is why are embeddings better for any task than one hot encoding? Yeah, an idea? 
especially the distances between one cross that and another? Yeah, it's exactly. So they have a they have a meaning. Well, the word so one hot encoding doesn't doesn't carry any meaning instead of saying, well, this is this word. <laughs> but if you have two words which have similar meaning, there will be you know, that there, there is no distance between words in this one hot encoding space, right? There are all the same same distance apart. While in word embeddings, what we really want, if you remember this analogy, king to, to man is like a woman to queen, like these analogies. So you can do this with word embeddings because each of these vectors lives in this low dimensional space or high dimensional, depending on your perspective, but it's much lower dimensional than a one hot, lives in this space and they, the closer they are in this space, the closer their meaning should be. This is what we try to learn, basically, in the first place. Like, uh, you know, things that occur together carry a similar meaning, whatever meaning is. And that's what we're going to use. So it's better here that uh, you, you already input into your network something which carries meaning than just one hot, one hot encoding. Because you, you will generalize maybe better. Uh, because if you see in the training data the cat set, and then you want to put the input the, the kitten set, like the tiny little cat. It's going to be somehow similar in a way. So the kitten and cat embeddings will might be, might be close to each other in this embedding space. That's how you work with synonyms or words with similar meaning. Okay? All right. So this was the input. And then the, the, the network will have some sort of uh, one output, so single output of dimension d out so it's going to be a vector and we're going to call it y y n okay so at y n uh, why is it this index n will be clear in the next slide but basically we have again we have a, a bunch of vectors on the input one two until n and then there is some something some neural network in between and then there will be an output of this function, which will be a vector. So again, like a recap, why, why a vector? Well, it's helpful for many, I mean, it's better than just a single number because you can use vector for uh, maybe a probability distribution prediction or some something else. Okay, vectors are great. The dimensionality, however, of these vectors, so this is the out and this is dimensionality of the in, it's it's not the same. It could be if could be different. It doesn't have to be the same. Okay. It's like in the MLP. So in MLP you have uh, a huge input, maybe like thousands, thousands of dimension, and then your output could be just a maybe four classes. So also you have different sizes. Okay. So then we just define the input and the output. So R and N it's gonna be a function. <laughs> Taking what was that again? One to n. What what is it again? The C yeah uh, here sequence of uh, sequence of vectors. So it takes a sequence of vectors and outputs a vector. <laughs> okay, cool. This is what we want. I mean, this is this is what we really want because if you're interested in working with sequence of inputs and do something cool on that, we take a sequence of vectors and output another vector. So this is the abstraction. Okay, and now the question is, okay, this is nice abstraction, but how does it really work? I mean, what do you, what is this? <laughs> what is what is here? Okay, and that's what we're gonna, what we're gonna tackle now in detail. But let's let's start a little bit with this abstraction to understand the implications of our sort of definition here. So because RNN, as we define, actually it returns not just a single output, but it returns a sequence of outputs, right? Why is that so? So this is our definition. For a sequence one to n, it gives us y n. So let's have an example. Let's have n equals to three, and our input sequence is x1, x2, x3. Okay, so these are three vectors which I'm plugging into my into my network, and what's coming out is uh, is uh, y2. Why is there why is there two? Okay, I don't know. I have to double check. Uh, it should be y3, I guess. Yes. Excuse me. This is a typo. Okay, so so I'm return. So as I said, like one to n is one to three. So y three should be basically at position three. It takes all the input and returns a vector. But also, 
our input sequence also contains uh, just a subpart one and two. Okay, so it also our model actually should return also y two for x one and x two, right? Because of for any sequence we're plugging in, it, it returns an uh, a vector. So in fact, it makes uh, RNNs outputting a vector at each position i. Okay. Does it make sense? So if I have a seek, if I have RNN uh, of n equals one, so this will be y n equals r n n x one. Okay, so I'm plugging here one vector in comes one vector out. Okay, if n equals two, I have two vectors in and one vector out. But also a subsequence of that is uh, just the first one. So I'm also outputting this for all the all the previous contexts, right? So each of those is taking the, so at position two, I'm taking the full input here, both of them. And at position one, I'm taking just the full input here, which is just a single one. So basically I'm outputting a vector for each position by this definition. Does it make sense? Okay. Right. Just replace n with one or two or three, and you'll you'll understand that uh, this is this is doing the thing. So let's call this uh, sequence outputting function r and star. Yeah, and it's a little bit of formalism, but maybe it will be clear later on why why this could be interesting. So basically, we're plugging in n embeddings, and we can output n uh, n vectors. Right. So it means do I have a space here? So if I have a um, one, two, three, three input vectors and plugging into the network, the output will be three vectors of different dimensions, right? And each will each of them will be able to look at the entire history. Okay. Good. Okay, so. Without knowing, I, I just said it, but let's let's try to you know answer this question. So without knowing what actually what RNN actually is, <laughs> we don't know what is in there. It's like we don't know how to implement this. We don't, we have no idea. But what could be the advantages of of having such a thing? So the advantages of having such a thing is that each output takes into account the entire history up until this point, without any mark of property. Okay, so if I have n equals 100, okay, I have like 100, uh, 100 input vectors. So let me just, let me just uh, write it here. Three, four, I'm not going to do 100, sorry. Uh, so it's going to be 100. Um, so it's 100. And then there will be a output vector at position 100. So this is going to be y100, and this is going to be x100. And it means the function here takes the entire history. So everything up, to, up, up until here, if I have something like r and n in the middle, and it outputs this vector, everything, the full context will be taken into account. Okay. This is what we want. I mean, we want to take the whole sequence and don't care about the Markov property, right? You remember the Markov property just taking maybe the last three words. But now RNN should, we don't know how exactly, but it should somehow be able to take the, the full input and produces for each of these uh, produce for each of, excuse me, for any part we cut here, it will produce an output vector. Okay, any questions? So what do we do with these outputs? So what do we do if we have, uh, maybe after seeing 100 words, we have one vector? Or we might have um, 100 input vectors and having, so here is this think R and N, R and N, and we have 100 output vectors of different dimensionality, okay? And now again, here, 
let me just use different colors to really, really highlight the advantages. So at input one, it just saw this vector. At input two, I have more colors, it saw this thing. At input three, sorry, output uh, three, it saw all the three outputs. Okay, so this is this is the whole sequence in there. So the question is what to do with those? What what can we how can we use these outputs? What what can we what can we model with them? So in this case, I mean, imagine, maybe there's an answer on the slide, so I don't know. Uh, I'm using Sorno here now, and uh, I don't see in the, uh, unfortunately, I don't see the next slide here, so I don't know what's in there. Maybe there's an answer, so don't look it up. But think about it. So you have any, any sequence of words which produces you a single vector. What can you do with that vector? You can, you can do some tasks, right? I mean, which tasks can you solve with this vector? So remember, we had MLP, multilayer perceptron, where we stack the full input as a back of words, and then we plug it into the network. And at the end, we got a, uh, a scalar or a vector and did some prediction. Okay. So now, we also have a bunch of inputs as vectors and have the vector at the output. So can we do some classification with that? Can we use this vector to do classification? Yes or no? So who thinks yes? OK, who thinks no? And the rest will think about it. OK, yeah, that's, that's true. You can use it exactly. That's, you can use this vector for some, some prediction. Because now, for example, if this were movie review, OK, so I really like this movie, but, I don't know, no, uh, but the actors were kind of OK, and blah, 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 100 words. And, it, and my network saw all the 100 words and all the history, so here, it could be a vector of size one, which could be like a input to the sigmoid function, which is the binary prediction. I mean, it could be basically a sigmoid over here. And it tells me, well, is it a positive or negative preview? So I can do it for classification. If I have multiple classes here, like, OK, here's a news article, which is more than 100 uh, words long. I mean, maybe like 400 words. And I have 20 categories I want to classify into like topics of these articles, like a news, sports, business, whatever. Well, this output could be basically a 20 size vector, and I can run softmax on top of that and do the classification of these news articles, right? So I can definitely, this is, you know, that's why I'm building it, right? It's just a sanity check. I, I can really use this as the, as the input of my, as the output of my sort of classifier here. So this is one, one use case. So I take the entire sequence and do something on top of that. What, where this could be interesting. So now I have a the cat set blah 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 a sequence, and for each word, I have a vector as well. So as you remember, we can use the vector for it could be a, a classification task. So where can I use this sort of information for for prediction? I mean, is there is there any task where I can Take each word and do some prediction depending on the on the word and the entire history. What can we do with that? Any ideas? What can we do with that? Is it is it of any use? Having having an output for each word. So we can say we can say something about each word in the in the input sequence based on the previous history. Is it of any use? Hmm. Is there any task where it's important to know something about each word? Hmm. So what if what if uh, sorry excuse me just uh, what if you have a text like uh, um, the event uh, happened at. Uh, Wow, at Times Square, where in New York City yesterday. It's a very stupid sentence, but anyway. So we have we have this sequence. The event happened at Times Square. 
in New York City yesterday. And we want to do with uh, with with uh, with the word something. I see you, but I'll, I wanna I wanna ask maybe other people. So I want to do something with each word. What can I do? What could be a meaningful task? Back 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 lecture number one. We had a couple of tasks presented, like sentiment analysis, uh, natural language inference. But there was one we had something to do with this, maybe this. Do you remember what was that? So what are these things? What is time square here in this in the sentence? What is time what is time square here in the sentence? I mean it's not hard. I mean whatever comes to your mind. So what is time square? It's a location. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean this is not rocket science. I mean this is location. New York City is also a location. So do we have a task where we are interested in locations and other other things? Do you remember that? We had named entity recognition. Remember, we have entities in the text, such as places or locations, names, uh, dates, maybe. So yesterday might, might be also entity. Uh, and we would say, oh, okay, um, I have a text, and for each word, and there was this thing we, we discussed, BIO encoding. Remember that? So we said for each token, whether it's uh, in the in an entity or outside of the entity. It's outside of the entity, it's O. And if it's inside entity, this would be like B, beginning of location, and this would be inside of location. Okay, so it's called basically uh, a sequence tagging. Remember that? So, okay, if you don't remember, just refresh, you know, the task from lecture one. Because this is one of the, one of the tasks that you can solve. So entity, excuse me. Um, it's basically tagging, where we are sequence tagging. Sequence tagging. So you take each word and you say, so here it could be like the event happened at Times Square in New York City yesterday. And for each word, you would predict one of those categories. Is it an O? Is it a B log? Is it I log? Is it maybe here a B time? or something like that. For each word, you would make a prediction. And this is how you do tagging. Could be any, you know, is there any uh, any other task that might be interesting for tagging? Uh, there is one, and maybe we talked about it, maybe we didn't. It's a part of speech tagging. So part of speech tagging. So you know what, it, well, you remember what a part of speech is? So it's like, uh, okay, nouns, verbs, adjectives, and stuff like that. You know, all the ling these linguistic categories. I mean, you, you learn it at school. I'm pretty sure about it. So, so here you would have, uh, for each word, you would, you would, um, you want to analyze this or categorize into one of the power of speeches. So saying, oh, okay, event is a noun, happened is a verb, at is a, oh, okay, I'm not a linguist. I, I forget all these texts. But anyway, you, you would basically categorize each of these, these words. Okay. So this is what you can also do with this. With this setup, where you take each word and you know output a, a label. Okay. Any questions? All right. So here's the answer again summarized. So we use it for further prediction. For extents, plug it into softmax or maybe some other multilayer perceptron and stuff like that, right? So softmax, why? Here we have a vector. So it's a vector of reals and I want to turn it into a probability distribution. So I can predict that this is the this is the category. Okay, so the standard, standard thing, softmax. All right, so this is great. So again, we can plug in a sequence of words and either take the last output and do prediction over the entire sequence or do the prediction for actually each of those inputs. And at each position, I've seen everything which has been in the history. This is great. Without any mark of property limit. So I can really take 100. Will it work? How do I, <laughs> how do I have to implement RNN? That it works and it just doesn't break. That's a, that's the million dollar question. So we're gonna we're gonna do that. So there is this underlying mechanism of uh, recurrent neural networks, and 
what we want to do is to pass information from one position to the next. So we are, so this is the output of position i, and this is the, what is it again? x1 to i. What is it again? Sanity check. Yes? Yeah, this is the sequence of the input vectors until up until i. Okay, so this is the output at y, and this is the entire, entire history. So we're going to go, go from uh, i to i plus 1, so basically the next next sort of state in the, um, in the sequence. And we need to pass some information. So we're going to use a, a state vector, okay? something we just introduced here. We're going to say there's a state vector, si, which has some dimensionality, which we can define, whatever it is. But we're going to pass this si from i1, OK, so from i, excuse me, y i to y i plus 1. Uh, for example, we have here the input, so two words. So this is 1 to 2. And in order to go to, and here we have the outputs, so x1, x2. Here is this some sort of RNN. Here we have y. Uh, one, y two, and now we're gonna go to step number three or position number three. So we're gonna pass here some sort of s state vector because we wanna pass the information between the states somehow. Makes sense, of course. I mean, you need to look into the history. So how are we going to do that? We're gonna pack this into some sort of uh, uh, a memory. So the state is going to be some sort of a memory. We say something from the from the history, and we pass it next to the next to the next state. Okay. Um, and so what we are interested in basically is computing the current state. So what do we need to save into the memory in the current state so we can pass it on to the to the next one? So again, at each step i uh, from position one until n, we have the current vector. And we have the vector of the previous state, si minus 1. And we don't have, uh, so the starting state vector is uh, would be s0, but we kind of assume this is a, this is 0, you know, a 0 vector, empty vector, sort of. Sort of. So then we're going to compute the current state by some sort of function, which we specify later. So this r function, where we take the previous state and the current input and produce the, the the current state okay so we have a let's say previously we had x uh, i minus one and this thing spit out the state vector s i minus one and also maybe some output which was y i minus one and here i have a I'm in position i, so I have input the xi. And here I want to spit out the this current state, si. So I'm just taking into account the previous one and the current vector. That's it. Makes sense. I mean, you're passing information from one state to another. And we're explicitly using this, um, this state vector to do so. What is in this state, state vector and how is it maybe different from the output and stuff like that, we'll discuss later. So it will be maybe much simpler than this, but generically you wanna save something into sort of a memory and pass this memory over and over. Why is it important? Well, because you wanna remember something from the very beginning. So if you have a like long, long sequence of, of words and you're some sort of important information, whatever that is, maybe the movie review, like uh, the movie was really, really, really bad, and then you talk about something very neutral for this prediction, you still want to remember something from the from the very beginning. So you, you better save it into the memory, so to say, and try to keep this state over and over, because then if you make the prediction, you're going to use this, you, you need to use something from the very beginning. So this is like lo long range dependency. And that's why you pass the information from one state to, to the other. Abstractly. So this is very abstract. I mean, yeah, of course, we're going to use some memory, of course. How is it going to work? What is this R function doing? We'll see later. But this is like a, 
we're defining RNN, not like saying, okay, here's an implementation of RNN. So let's have a look and well, why does it, I mean, you'll see later, uh, LSTM, it's super complicated. So if you start with this super complicated stuff, it's maybe kind of too overwhelming to understand the, the basic the basic kind of assumptions we're doing. We take a sequence of inputs, we're passing the states from one of each other, and we're spitting out the output in each state. That's somehow the abstraction, okay? Any questions? Okay. So, oh, okay, of course. So now we know how to compute the current state. And we also need to compute the current output. And we're actually going to use uh, the current state and run some function on that and spit the output. OK. So what we really care about is the state. So we're passing the state from one, one position to the other. So again, here we have x, i. We have some previous s i minus one, so it's a it's a vector again exactly uh, actually so it's a vector, so I'm modeling the here the s i so this is where I get the the current state, and so this is what we had here right I mean the current state somehow was uh, from the previous from the input and the previous state so this is what we what we get here, and what we are saying here that actually the output at this point will somehow depend only on this state. So not on the input, not on the previous state, but somehow only on this current state. So I'm going to take the output here, and it, it will give me uh, uh, it will give me the yi. OK, so there is some output function taking into account just the si. So I'm kind of like making more sort of conditional independence here between these, these things. So I'm saying, yeah, OK, the output actually depends on the previous state or the entire history, but the entire history is just crammed into the state vector. And everything I have in the state vector and what I'm coming, what is the, the current input should be enough to make some prediction here, okay? So basically all the information has to be crammed into uh, the state vector. It's not like, you don't, you don't see, I mean, I was, so, so here I was saying, here you see the entire history, like a three tokens here. Yeah, but how do you exactly see the three tokens? It's not like you, you're kind of accessing directly the inputs, but you're passing by state by state. That's how you see the entire history. That's how it works internally. So make it simple. Why, why is that so? Well, for reasons, because you want to learn some, some functions and their parameters, and you want to be these parameters maybe like time independent. So the same parameters should work at if you're no matter if you're position 20 or 200 or something. So we'll see that later. But basically we're passing the states here in the old. Okay. So let's sum it up. We took an abstract view on RNN where we say we have n steps and at each each of these time steps we have the current input xi. So again what what is the current current input xi? So xi is a what is xi? We said we're going to feed it with something. What is xi? So we have words. xi is uh, a word at position position i, but what is it exactly? Is it a, I don't know, one hot scalar, something else? What is it? We said we we're going to feed our network with something which knows something about semantics, right? So what is xi? It's a word, it's a word embedding. OK, so we have a xi, which is a word embedding. We have a previous state. So the previous state state, also it's a bold letter, so it's a vector. Okay, so we have a vector for the current current word. We have a vector for the whole state before. And we compute two things. We compute the current state, taking these two into account. So we're taking these two. And given this, given this state, we're compute, we're gonna compute the uh, the output. And the functions R and O, so these things computing the state and the output are same for each position I. Okay, so we're gonna use the same functions. Because it doesn't make any sense to have uh, a different function for position that, you know, uh, for a word at position one, for a word position two, and so on. You wanna use, you know, you wanna generalize. You wanna make it 
as generic as possible. So there's functions computing the state, there's function computing the output, and then you just you just let it run. And no matter how long the input should be, these functions should behave the same. All right, so here's the here's a summary. Um, what we are having is that for a sequence of inputs and uh, so S0 was the initial state, right? It was like initial state, which is a uh, zero filled vector. But I guess I had it on, on some previous slide anyway. So it gives us a sequence of output vectors and at each point Y we're getting, uh, we're computing the, the current state and we're computing the current output. So this is the abstraction of, this is the machine we want to build. Like this is the sort of um, um, the interface definition. Okay, and now we, now we have to define two things. We have to see what this is and what this is and how we're gonna, how the heck can we do it with data and learn it and do uh, deep learning with that? I mean, it's a, it's a network because it's, do you see like it's a computational graph because we're, we have connecting, you know, vectors with uh, some functions in there, and there it, it's a chain of uh, chain of these functions where you have the output at the end. So it's it's a computational graph. So of course we should be able to learn these outputs from some input data, but the devil is here in the detail. Like what is the R and O? So let's have a look at that. Oh, finally some some visualization which is much better than just my uh, how do you call it, uh, kritzel kratzel. So. So we can do like this uh, visualization of RNN and it's still abstract RNN uh, recursively. Okay, so here, finally, we have some colors. So we have the uh, the XI, which is the input at position uh, I. We have the previous S mi uh, I minus one. We have the output here and we have the, the current state. And basically the current state is also used for the output, by the way, here. And this is saying, well, this is this 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 arrow is this recursive definition. So for each point, you know, you kind of basically go back and and run again this function R and O and and so on and so on. So do you understand this kind of uh, recursive uh, recursive picture? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So what is this? Any ideas? I mean, it, it's called theta, so it should tell you something. We 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 use very very few very very few Greek uh, Greek letters, maybe one or two. So what is theta? Yeah, that's some parameters. And if you remember all the previous lectures, I'm using the green color for showing learnable learnable parameters in the network. So this is something. Train, trainable parameters. Of course, because these functions will be somehow parameterized by something. So these functions could be some maybe linear functions or something like that. And we want to learn them so that they, they work, okay? So all the green no all the gray nodes are going to be um, basically constant. So, well, I mean, this is a constant node, right? This is a, this is a constant because it's a training data. So it doesn't change. So it's a constant in a way because it's in the training data. We cannot change that, but we have to change the parameters. And all these uh, uh, light gray nodes are, are the states. Do I write it here? No, I don't. Okay, so this is the abstract, but this is actually much more, much clearer. So this is actually what I should start with, but we'll, uh, we, are, we came to that. So this is sort of so-called unrolled version of recurrent neural networks, right? This is um, this is showing the the the, recurs the recursion. That's why it's called recur uh, recurrent or recurrency, the recurrent neural networks. But here we kind of really make each step explicit. So we have here four time steps. So this is maybe the word the cat set on maybe something else. And and again, this is the this is the uh, the initial hidden, uh, not hidden, the initial state, which is zero. And here we're having, we're applying the function R and O on each, at each time step, generating the output and generating the hidden state. And now we're passing that to the next state where we take the next input, the previous state and stuff like that. So this is the computational graph. Okay, this is, uh, 
I, I believe a much clearer depiction than the rec than the rec uh, recurrent or recursive depiction because it's how it really works. Okay, so first question: Why are these? So this is, was again was the parameters, right? Theta parameters. Why are these parameters going? You know, why is there just a single bunch of parameters going to each node? What does it mean? Why are these parameters tied to all all of them? What does it mean? So how many how many parameter nodes are are we having for the whole thing? We're, we're just having one. There is one set of parameters, and they are somehow tied to each of these functions. So what does it mean? It means that these functions are these functions R and O, they have some parameters. The functions R and O are the same at each position. And also it means that these functions R and O have the same parameters, no matter if you're at position one or two or three or four. Right? This is like shared parameters. So the parameters of these functions will be shared independent of the position of this input. Okay, because I mean, what you can theoretically have now, now. Okay, what you can have, if these functions are parameterized, you might have theta one, and here theta two, and here theta three. That's you can you can build that theta four. What would be the disadvantage of having this theta one, theta two, theta three, theta four, and so on? There's two disadvantages of having parameters for each of the functions. Practically, I mean, you have a, you have much more parameters. So, what's going to be hard? It's going to be hard to train them. You know, like if you have like if you have input of ten, you know, just if if n would be like hundred words, you would have to be like hundred more parameters, hundred times more parameters. So, it's going to be hard to learn these data. So, this is second, the first one. The second one, well, you don't really, maybe you don't really care if you are at position one or at position three. Because maybe you want the functions to behave in a similar way. Given the previous context, they should do something, but you do, you shouldn't care whether you're, you know, at the very beginning of the sentence or in the middle of the sentence, or there may be some few words in between. You want to learn the same thing. Like, a, I don't know. For example, it was bad and it was very bad. You know, here at your, you're at position three and you're at position four here, but both of them should learn that the previous thing and the given word is a is a negative review. But here you just plug one word, uh, you know. But so maybe you want to keep the same parameters for each node here. So that's the there's two two reasons. One is sort of fundamental, like this notion of uh, time invariance. I don't know if it's a correct term, but I believe the, so. You you don't care if you're position one or one plus one that much. And the second one is just you want to learn some parameters, but you know not hundred times more parameters. Okay, so let me just delete it and forget it. But there's a re there's a reason why why we have these data shared. All right, questions. So now it's now it's clear, right? So you know what it is. So send it to check. What is, for example, what is this thing? Is it a is it a, a number, a vector, a matrix, tensor? What is it? So it's a vector. So we say like the states are vectors, okay? We're passing vectors. Okay. State vector. What is this? It's a vector as well. We have vectors. And this is we I asked again, so this is the embedding, embedding of uh, of this word, like set. Okay, so this is it. This is a network we can build. And no, oh. <laughs> okay, really, I can. So you know, I, I I used to use the other tool where I saw like the next slide in my in my laptop, and the actual show it was running here, but it doesn't work on, on Max for some reasons, so I don't see in the future. So maybe I'm telling something which is already in the slides and you can see, and then it's surprising to me. Anyway, so yeah, the theta are parameters, they're shared because they're same for all positions. 
Okay. So now we saw this before, right? This is our, our computational graph. And now we, we want to use this for, let's say, a sequence. So basically encoding the, the whole sequence into one vector here and then classify the whole sequence. So we, we take the, the final output. So either directly the, this vector or maybe, yeah, it could be vector. Okay, so this is a vector. And how you turn a vector into probability distribution. So yes, we use softmax, so we get a probability distribution. What is this L? What is it? What is L? Uh, what is this node? Yeah, yeah, that's a loss. <laughs> that's a loss. That's why it's called L. <laughs> that's a loss. What is this? This is gold label. Okay, cool. Yeah, of course. What? How does it look? So we have softmax here. So what is the gold label? In which form do we have to present the gold label? If this, so we have vector here. We put softmax, a probability distribution. So kind of this must be something. This must be something. What is it? Yeah. It's one hot. Yeah. Exactly. So this is one hot encoding. So categorical one hot. So we have zero, zero, zero. And for this category, it's gonna be one. So maybe for for the news, it could be it's a sport. It's a sport news. Okay. So here we're getting a probability distribution, and here we're getting just one hot and Okay, which loss are we going to use? We know two losses, and it's not going to be uh, the binary cross entropy loss. It's going to be something else. If we have one hot vector as gold label, categorical, and we have uh, here, so what's going to be the loss again? What is it? Uh, yes. Categorical cross entropy, yes. <laughs> Almost. No, no, no. I would, I would accept that. So it's going to be cut categorical, categorical cross entropy. Yeah. So I, I have a feeling, so, you know, um, these are sort of things that you might be already remembering because we're talking on them like every week and every, every exercise. So my, my suggestion would be like, um, if you haven't started learning, like, I mean, you're coming to the lectures and the exercises, that's fine, but maybe there's more you need to do in order to, you know, keep pace with that. So I strongly suggest you start learning a little bit or quite a lot, right? Because then you're you're just going to hate me on the, on the exam date, okay? So if I say something is important, you should remember, it means <laughs> you should know it in the next lecture. Otherwise, you're, you're going to struggle a little bit. So I said a couple of times, categorical cross entropy is very important, you should know. If I say softmax is very important, you should know. I mean, you know softmax because you did the computations and the exercises. That's great, but we cannot cover everything in the exercises. So you have like hands-on experience. So some, some things you really need to know. And I'm, I'm always trying to highlight what is important, right? I mean, if not, just let me know, but I'm mostly asking sanity questions sort of say, or like this, you know, uh, double checking that on, on things that are like key concepts in here. Okay. Like what is word embedding? So you should, you should really know what is a word embedding, where it comes from and stuff like that. Okay. Because we spent uh, like uh, two and a half hours on that. All right. So this is, uh, sorry, no, off, off record, really start working on that. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be painful in, in January or February. Okay. So we have this we have this computational graph, and now I mean this is a full graph. Basically, this is again what something we can really build now, either using our very tiny little framework. Actually, we could do that. Why not? But well, we're not going to do that. We can use Torch because, as we saw yesterday, PyTorch is basically building uh, such a computational graph for you in background in background using the uh, the primitives of the of the of the framework, which means. This will be our training data, like the word embeddings here, and this will be our gold label. So we can basically, we can basically train the parameters of this network, right? We can train the parameters by standard means of doing deep learning using stochastic gradient descent. And at each step for a stoch of a stochastic gradient descent, you're gonna do two things: computing the loss and do backpropagation, backpropagation to find parameters, excuse me, to find the partial derivatives of these functions with respect to the parameters and do this step. 
This is the very same. This is really, we can pluck so, so many things. If you can express things as a computational graph where each node is a function and it has derivatives, you can, you can do the propagation on that and, and, and find it in, uh, in SGD. Okay, so this is, this is no surprise. If this is surprising to you, I would really suggest you to go through the lectures again and the exercises we had on, on the propagation and, uh, and gradient descent, okay? But we're using the same mechanism over and over. This is why, why it's so powerful. You have just one algorithm. I mean, basically, okay, there is one algorithm which kind of does everything. Stochastic gradient descent and deprivation. This is the algorithm, the only algorithm you really need for doing NLP most of the days. There might be some like reinforcement learning or could be some others, whatever, but there are sort of like marginal, I would say. And the main bulk is just one single algorithm. Okay. If you compare it to some other computer science branches where you just learn about tons of algorithms, here there's just one algorithm and it just works for everything. This is the beauty of that. So you have one framework which you need to learn, like PyTorch. One algorithm behind which you never implement basically because it's already implemented. So the only thing you need to do is like, oh, how do I design my network, and how do I do the experiments correctly and evaluation, and you know how how do I make it, it it learns the way I want to learn. Okay. So this is the this is the supervision on the last output here, which kind of summarizes through passing the states. It summarizes the whole sequence of words and can do some predictions. Okay. Any questions? So does it do, is it is everything clear on this picture? That's great. Okay. Now we can also. So, well, might be it. It looks a little bit messy, but it's actually it's it it's not. So let's try to disentangle that. So, this is for sequence tagging as we had before. So for each word. So again the. Cat set on. And here, what I want, what would be the labels? Okay, oh, uh, um, uh, so the part of speech of D is determiner, I guess. That cat will be a, a noun. Noun set would be a verb on. It's a preposition and so on. So this is the part of speech, part of speech tagging, right? So this is a part of speech. How is it in German, by the way? I'm really curious. So uh, noun is a, uh, how's noun in German? Nomen, <laughs> cool. How is verbs? Verben, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think I knew that. Determiner, like D. Article, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That he does not. Uh, and preposition, preposition. You know part of speech taking already. Okay, cool, good. You learn it, I guess, in a in a maybe a grammar school or some of the some of the first first couple of classes at school. Okay, cool. So that's we wanna what we gonna uh, predict here in the sequence tagging or part of speech tagging. And of course, now for each of these tokens, we have we we have the the gold label. Of course, this is the this is something you don't get for free. I mean, you need to annotate it, right? So for in order for to to do like part of speech tagging or name and recognition, you really need to manually create the labels for each word. So if somebody asks you to do a, a student assistant job and annotating like name and recognition or annotating part of speech, you don't want to do it. Unless it's really well paid, because it's really boring job, and you really have to do a, a determiner noun and so on. So it's very kind of tedious work. Well, somebody has done this tedious work for us, so we have data sets, and we can you know use them for training part of speech tagger or uh, name and trigger recognizer. Okay. But here, basically, we have for each of these positions, we have the signal. All right. So this lower part of the network we had before. So this is the the sort of standard recurrent neural network architecture without actually saying what R and O is, right? We don't still know, but we can, we are saying what can we, how can we use it and how can you train it? So it's important. And again, we're sharing the parameters. So this is the same, like the, you know, excuse me, this this part remains the same. We're, we unroll the, the, the recurrent, recurrent network and we have the shared parameters, the hidden states and the, uh, and the parameters. But now instead of having just a single single output here, which could be a, a label of the whole sequence. Now we're labeling each of them. So we have really output of each at each step. 
And this is going to be a vector. So we can run, excuse me, we can run a softmax on that, get a prediction. So again, we have the loss here. So now I'm asking again, so what is this loss going to be? Which loss are we going to use? Yeah, it's going to be categorical cross entropy. Okay, so categorical cross entropy. Most mostly, like in majority of cases, you would use this loss. You can use any other loss you want, but this is like what you're typically using. So you have the categorical cross entropy for each of the nodes. Okay, so it tells you how off are you in this determiner. But now we'll see for oh, this is really cool. So now we are at the beginning of the sentence, and it's coming the. Yeah. So I have no previous context, so I have to learn somehow that the is actually the determiner. Okay, cool. This is something, it's plausible. Now, if I'm the second word, so uh, I have in, uh, I'm inputting the second word, and here I'm taking the previous state into account, so it learned some. It should learn something about the previous word. It should learn maybe the previous word is deter determiner, or not. Something, some information should be there. So it will, it will make me my life easier to predict that the next word is a noun, right? Because after determiner, typically comes a noun, the cat. It shouldn't be a verb. Verb wouldn't make any sense, like the, the working. Uh, well, it's an adjective. Well, anyway, so you get a gist. I mean, for this, for this, uh, this task, we're really utilizing the previous context. So it's really helping us to, to get better results than just taking these things in isolation. Okay. So, and here again, we're predicting this is a going to be known and, and, and so on and so on. So now we are having, for each word, we are having a loss, right? We are having four different losses. How can you, how can you minimize a loss of four I mean, a loss is a, should be a single scalar. So you know how to minimize a function with, which is a scalar because you want to make the loss lower. It's a single number. If you have four losses, what you're going to do, you have to combine them somehow together to have just a single, single number, single scalar loss. So the simplest thing is just you sum them up, which gives you the, the final loss, right? The, the, the final loss. So you're going to, what you're going to do is you're going to optimize the final loss. So minimize the final loss as usual. So the graph has to have one output node. This is going to be the final loss. The final loss is consisting of these four different losses. Yeah, but why not? Because you can, it's a, it's a sum and you know how to do partial. So what you need to do finally is to find partial derivative of this final loss with respect to the parameters. That's what you're going to do. But here you have a sum, sum, uh, sum node, so you're summing things, but you know how to do partial derivatives with respect to each of these children. That's what you can do. We, we Actually, we program it in the second exercise. So this is very easy. I mean, basically, backpropagation works here because each of these nodes is differentiable. So you can do backpropagation. Isn't it cool? I think it's really cool. I mean, you can do, you know, other, you can make an aver average loss maybe or other things. It, it doesn't really matter as long as there's one output number and you're just trying to, in each step, make it smaller by taking a step in the direction opposite to the gradient. That's it. All right. So any questions? Everything clear on this picture? Awesome. Now, we might, okay, let's, let me see where we are. Okay, let's do sli two slides and then make a short break. Um, the disadvantage so far is that we're running everything from left to right, which is great. It's somehow mimics the, if you remember the, the traditional town-based um, uh, language models where you take the uh, n-grams and basically the history. So, it goes left to right. But maybe sometimes it's better to have it right to left and or combine these two because maybe you're interested in, the, in predicting the whole sequence, like the sentiment of the whole sequence. You see the whole document. You don't have to read it left to right. You can read it right to left. Why not? I mean, if I give you a document like movie review, 
you can just read it once and then skip again as a, as a human. I mean, you can read the first sentence and the last sentence and it come back and so on. So you see the whole document. So it doesn't have to be like you have to read it from left to right. I mean, you would read it left to right, but maybe come back and stuff like that. So we can combine this into so-called bidirectional RNNs. So it's taking two directions. So we have one RNN left to right, as we have here. So left to right, right? I mean, these, the flow goes from left to right. Yeah, so this is one RNN. But we can use another RNN from right to left. Why not? So we have here the input, D cat set, and here's one RNN, and maybe here's another RNN going right to left. And then we just combine them together. Maybe just concatenate the outputs. We can do that. So it gives us basically here from the left to right, the vector is going to be at the last word. And from right, right to left, the vector is going to be on the, on the first word. So here it takes all the information from left to right. Here it takes all the information from right to left. And we can combine them together by basically, so this is a concatenation. So we basically, we make it one large vector. And this is our output. Well, and then we can run, we can use this vector for softmax and other things as we had before. Make sense or you're confused? Yeah. would run from the one side to the third and from the other side from the vector. Is that because we go from one to i and from n to i, so we don't do the same, but we have like two parts? Yeah. Right, Mr. Yeah, we have two parts. So these are somehow independent. So this is this is one network from left to right, and there is another network from right to left, so to say. But I'm taking the output and doing the, the final prediction on the on the single single vector. Yes, yeah, on the same data, left to right. You're not predict so you're not doing like sequence classification here. You take you're doing uh, the whole document classification. So we are. Let me. Uh, I'll come to you uh, just in a second. So here, we we this is the supervision. So this is the the classification maybe of the whole review. Okay, so you're you're you know where we are. This is this is what we have. Okay, so what we're just gonna do. So this is one. Here we get one vector. So this is the output, and I'm gonna run it through softmax and have some supervision. Okay, what we're gonna do instead is start from here. So this would be like S0, start from here, then get here S1, whatever. So you have to change the indices to make it work, but then you have this and here and here and here, right? And then this will be your output, okay? So you can do that. You can write, you can run it from, from the right and here you have the output. So what you're gonna do now is to take this vector and this vector, concatenate them into one vector. So this is the first half, this is the second half. And so, sorry. And then you can run through softmax or another multilayer perceptron to you have to do. Uh, you have to run it through at least one one la layer to match the dimensionality because now your gold label. I mean, depending on what your output is, actually, you, you don't have to do that. But now you have just uh, you concatenated le uh, the left to right and right to left into one vector, and this one vector has the full information from two different sort of perspectives about the whole document, and then you can run the classification on top of that.
one direction and from end to right that it means we don't run it down through the whole document but just through a certain point. Oh, no, 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 no. We, you run it through the whole document. Well, okay. M let me let me see what is here. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, you can. So this is more, this is kind of like advanced thing. You can basically do it for not for the whole document. So here, this was for like for for the entire document prediction. You can do it also for each word. So maybe you want to predict the middle word. So you can run it from left to right to this word, and then the right context will be to this word, and then you concatenate and do the same thing. Yeah. That's what I understand. All right. Cool. Thanks. I didn't understand the question. You were you had comments or questions, or is it clarified now? No, no, no. The RNNs will be, they will have different parameters. So this will be like theta one, and this will be like maybe theta two. They will typically use the same architecture, typically. And uh, you don't have to, you can use whatever you want. Typically, use the same architecture and concatenate the stuff together. Uh, obviously, they are parameterized differently. No. And for some tasks, some tasks this works better, like uh, for the full document classification. Because I mean, of course, <laughs> sometimes it's better to look into the future to make decision about the current step, right? I mean, makes sense. So if you can afford it in terms of I see the full document, I can run it from both states. Then you just use B, B, R, N, N, and you call it a day. Okay, makes sense. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, let's make a short break. Seven minutes, so we start at uh, four. Okay, nine minutes, forty-two. Okay, nine forty-two. All right, so let's continue. Um, <laughs> this is it, the direction awareness, and okay. So, and the the as I said, like the question is really. We haven't talked about these R and O. So what's happening in, in there? How do we actually make, how do we make this work? Like, what does it have to be here to combine each input with the previous state to produce something meaningful that we can really learn either this part of speech tagging or any other sequence tagging or the classification? What needs to be there? So, um, well, yeah, let's have a look. So let's start with a so-called a simple RNN. And it dates back to, actually, RNNs were super popular or became popular in the 90s. And you might be asking, oh, why the heck are we learning something from the 90s? It's not important anymore. Not really. So there's some design choices to, you know, to be made. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a really landmark in, in, uh, in NLP. So it, was, it became, again, very popular in NLP in a 2000, maybe 13, 14, 15, 16. So you could really use these RNNs to do very cool tasks, which you couldn't do with other means like multi perceptron. So there's a reason why we're learning RNNs. And they are still still being used in many places because they have, um, they're smaller than this large language models and stuff like that. So they, they are important, I guess. So the very simple, Elman is the author. Elman Network simple simple RNN is something you, you might remember. Is that okay? So again, this is the abstraction we had before. So this is the input at step i, the previous hidden state, the output, and the the current hidden state. Okay. So let's do very simple thing. Let's say the output is actually the hidden the, the state. Okay. So these two things are actually equal. Okay, this, this is gonna make our life easier. Okay, we don't have to compute O. So O is basically identity. So we don't have O, and the output here is basically the input of the next step. Okay, makes sense? That's like a super simplification. So basically we don't, the next state is going to be the output. It's the same, same thing. So we don't, we don't care about the O at all. Okay, so this is one simplification. Now, what R is going to be, okay, so if you have two vectors, <laughs> you have two vectors, right? So this is a vector of the current input, and this is a vector of the previous state. So you have two vectors, and you want to create another vector. 
What, what can you do? So you can just sum them up. But summing up is maybe there's no parameters in summing up two vectors. So, oh, you might want to do some linear projection followed by some nonlinearity. Ah, OK. We've seen that before. <laughs> like, OK, so what is this? What is this doing? Xi, remember Xi is an input at position Y. And what is W? What is W? What, 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 what did we use for W? It's a matrix, right? A matrix of weights. What is this doing? We're multiplying a vector by a matrix. What are we doing? What do you do if you take a vector and multiply by matrix? Do something. It's a it's it's a operation. Some function on the vector. So I change the vector. You change the vector by multiplying by matrix. Yeah. So, but it has a meaning. Uh, it, it it's something. If you take a vector and multiply by a matrix, you're doing something with a vector. You, you a function. Sure. But what is it? Okay. Linear algebra. So you, <laughs> linear algebra. Remember that. You have a vector and you multiply it by matrix. It's a linear operation, so you do some sort of thing. And remember, we had you can change the vector from a change. You can do something with the vector and also change the dimensional of the vector. So you can go from maybe from 3D, maybe to 2D or 1D. So you're doing a thing. What is it? What was that? What is multiplying vector by a matrix? It's a linear projection. It's a linear projection. You're projecting the vector to some other space, and it's defined. This operation is defined by the matrix. OK, linear projection. Yes? No, you can make it bigger. It's linear projections. Why is it, why is it linear projections? Because li lines will be lines. If you have a line in one vector, if you have a line in one, you know, in one, uh, one space, one vector, OK, it's a vector space. If you need to define vector space, you define by the operation. So it's like long definition vector space. And you have to define also on which kind of, um, you have to define the scalars. So, but there's a definition of vector space and it's defined by basically being linear in these two, you know, uh, in these two operations, which is um, uh, addition and blah. Anyway, so there's like, a, okay, vector spaces from one to another. And each each vector space, if it's a linear operation, if you have a if you have a line in one space and do a linear projection, the line will be again a line. That's why it's called linear projection. So you cannot change lines. Remember, we had a, a line boundary, and no matter what you do, if you learn a li linear classifier, so it's a linear projection, the line will be a line. So you cannot use lines for classifying stuff which is not you know not linearly separable. That's that's the reason. Why we have to introduce some nonlinearity to kind of bound these these lines into something else? But a linear projection, multiplying a vector by a matrix is a linear projection. Lines remain lines. You can change the dimensions; could be smaller, could be the same, could be more. But it's a linear projection. Okay, everybody agrees. Good. So we're projecting, and we did it a couple of times. So like projecting this input vector to something else, defined by this. Uh, by the dimensional of this matrix, okay? So you can, it can be smaller, it can be bigger. Now, so we're projecting the input to something else. What is doing this? So the SI minus one was a previous state. It's a vector, we're multiplying by matrix. What are we doing? We're doing a linear projection again. So we're projecting, we're projecting again, uh, the previous state to something else. What is this? The bias, yeah, the bias, okay. So we're we're taking a vector, projecting to other space, taking the other vector, projecting to other space, sum them up together and add the bias. Okay, so this is this is how you combine two, it's a, it's a way to combine two vectors by projecting them to some space and then sum them up in this, in this new space, okay? What is this? Because linear projection is a linear projection. If you stack linear projection in 
if if you if you remove this from your RNN, what you end up with is still a linear function. I mean, if you stack up linear functions together, it will be a linear function, and that's the same issue like lines will remain lines. So it won't solve any nonlinear problem. So you want to introduce some sort of non-linearity. So the G is some nonlinear function, such as a, a sigmoid or yeah, mostly sigmoid, or maybe tan h somehow. Okay. Because you do the projection, the linear projection, and you want to kind of squish the space into something else. The same principle as we had in a in MLP or in a in a local lock linear model also. Like was a no, not linear was a lock, sorry, excuse me, lock linear model was a linear, but in multilayer perceptron, we had this nonlinearity in the hidden layer. So that's what you want to do. All right? So it doesn't make sense now what we're doing. Can you relate to that? So we're taking these two vectors, both project into new space, then add them in together in this space and add a bias and put some nonlinearity in there. Okay, that's it. So these things, the WS and WX, are the parameters, they will be shared for each of these, each time step, right? We had it here. So this will be the parameters and they will be the same for both of them. So what, if you learn the network, you're gonna get the partial derivatives through all the ways here because of the, the chain chain rule. And you're gonna update the parameters, which will be the, the weight matrix and two weight matrices and the bias. So that's how you're gonna learn it. How the network is going to learn it for you because you don't have to code it up. I mean, it's just you learn it by backpropagation. Okay. And this function is a two linear function, sum them up and do some non, non uh, linear activation on top of that. Okay. So now here's, yeah, here's exactly. So let's so start with the G. So it's commonly, oh, okay, ReLU, right. Oh, we have, we have ReLU. So what is ReLU? Who remembers ReLU? What is ReLU? Function that uh, takes um, input uh, input. Uh, if it's um, below zero, then it's um, just output zero. And if it's okay. above zero, it's um, outputs the uh, data. This is Raul. Okay. Why is Raul cool? Why is Raul good? Why, why is Raul interesting? Super fast to compute. It's just the identity here and zero. What's the derivative of ReLU? Oh, people. Okay, okay, okay. Derivative of ReLU. One, zero. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Fast, simple, easy, works. Non-linearity. All right, so ReLU. Tangus hypergolicus is uh, something like something like um, that I believe is a tan H. So it's looks like a sigmoid, but it has a different range from, I believe minus, minus, minus one to plus one, right? Yeah, it has to be minus one. It's, um, it's, tang, uh, it's tangents, but kind of uh, shifted, not shifted, uh, rotated. And tangents goes from, Okay, no, somebody has to double check now on Wikipedia, please. I mean, I don't wanna, I wanna tell, tell uh, lies here and I don't remember what's done, done age. Can you, is it from minus one? Can you, can you check that right now, please? 10 age. Oh yeah, it's from minus one. To yeah, minus one to plus one. Okay, so this is 10 age. And it is some expression like x, uh, x of x over something like that. Okay, so you can look it up. The ReLU or tan h, but it's not learned. This is important. Thank you. Um, then, of course, here the dimensionalities are somehow they have to match. So if our xi has these uh, input, uh, okay, I think there's a typo. It should be d in here and d. S here. I need to fix that. But anyway, so the there have a xi as the input and the si and yi because they are the same. They have some d uh, the s input. So then 
these matrices have to match their dimensions because we're projecting from input dimension to the output dimension. So these matrices has to be has to be matching, you know, the um, basically the dimensions we want to uh, the, the vector space, the dimension of the vector space we want to project into. So they have these dimensionalities, the n times the s, the s times the s, because we're this is uh, projecting. So this is the same dimensionality as the output. This has different dimensionality as the output, and b has to match the dimensionality of the output. So okay, you have to just make sure that the dimensions of the matrices of the parameters just match what you're gonna what you're gonna multiply them with. So linear algebra doesn't break, but that's basically it. So these are linear projections and some nonlinear function. Okay. Um, the thing here is, and I think we talked about it already in the in the exercise, that the gradient in in these networks might vanish, which means the gradient will be exceedingly close to zero as they propagate back through the computational graph. So. Because you might be starting getting smaller gradients here, and if you do the chain, you know the chain rule and backpropagate the gradients through the whole network by multiplying very small gradients, you end up with very very small smaller gradients. I mean, multiplying two small numbers gives you even smaller number, and multiplying even more small numbers gives you even small number, and you end up with zero. So the gradients might, you know, because and the great how how the gradients are computed is you take all these partial derivatives times this partial derivatives times this partial derivative times this partial derivatives times this partial derivative and the chain rule okay this is how you compute the, the gradient uh, the partial derivative of the loss with respect to and there here's a loss the loss with respect to these parameters so the longer the chain is if you have some small if you have small gradients somewhere in the chain then you're risking that you actually end up with your gradient close to zero so do you remember what why gradient close to zero is bad or zero gradient? Why is zero gradient bad? Why don't you want to have a zero gradient? You don't move exactly. You don't move. You're you have a parameters minus learning rate times a gradient, which is minus learning rate times zero, and you're just staying there, so it doesn't learn anything. So it means. The error, so to say, don't really back propagate through the whole network, so you don't you don't really update the, the parameters deep in your network. So it's bad for learning. And then, which means for the simple RNNs, it's hard to capture these long range dependencies because you really want to capture the whole the whole sequence, the long range, so to say. I mean, learning this. This short sequence might be maybe better, like having the gradients here. The gradients might be nice here, but if you go deeper, 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 the gradients might try to vanish to zero. And it's actually a problem in these simple RNNs. Okay, so that's why they are nice theoretically and they are simple, but they just practically don't work because of this vanishing gradient thing. You just don't learn it. Okay, any questions? Vanishing gradient. We also talk about the exploding gradient, where you, the gradient is, you know, very high in each of these steps, and then you're just gonna end up with, uh, you know, uh, taking super large steps or even like overflow in a in a numerically overflow. Okay, but the vanishing gradient is a thing at RNN, so and that's why it prevented them from being really powerful in um, doing uh, long long sequences. So, okay, let's try to take a different approach here. Um, and we talked about it already. So the state. Right, we're passing the state from so the state vector. We're passing from one time step to another step. So this is really saving, basically, what's in right. This is saving everything what was what was in there before. Everything which has been up until step one is safe in the state vector. Everything which is here up until step two is in the state vector and here in this vector. So this is sort of like memory, right? This is like working memory. Because we're saving something which we need to keep for, for future. And we're passing that by. OK. So basically, the SI represents a finite memory. Why is it finite memory? Yeah, because it's just a vector. Just a memory. I don't care. Uh, I don't know why it's finite. But anyway, it's a, it's a memory. And it remembers basically everything from the previous steps. And how are you going to compute the state? In the simple RNNs, is uh, 
this projection. Yeah, this is this function we had. So you take the previous, previous memory and, oh, what is it doing? So you take a previous memory and do some projection. You take the current input and some other things. And this is how you and do some nonlinearity. And this is what's going to be saved in the memory. Okay, well, it makes sense. So you're at a step, you're at step, you're here at step two and you're getting new input. So you want to somehow update update your, your state by taking the input into account. So you just basically add it to your memory, right? This is basically doing this. You're adding, <laughs> you're adding your inputs to your memory in a way and some bias. So you're updating your memory. That's what you're, that's what this network is doing. Make sense? So, so each application of this function R is basically, it takes the, that's what we just said. So it takes the current memory uh, as from the previous step, reads the input, operates on them in some way. Yes, I mean, here we just add them up and writes the result into the memory SI again. Yeah, so this is it. This is the update. I mean, operates on them in some way is the crucial part, like how you how you're gonna make it better or worse. But basically, you're combining this current state with the input, and you're updating the state. Okay, all all good. So, memory access is not controlled. <laughs> At each step, entire memory state is is read, and entire memory state is written. Oh, that's that's true because you're not saying because the memory is really a vector. It's it's if you think like about mem if you think about it like as a computer memory, it has a size could be I don't know something like one uh, k thousand real numbers so it could be a vector in a in thousand dimensions but and it stored something it stores something you don't know what a something is first and you don't control what actually should be updated or what what not because this is this computation just takes the full memory do some projection maybe to some smaller space or the same space whatever could be the same space again R thousand, then takes the input xi, projects into another vector, which is also the same dimensionality, and just add them up. So whatever comes here will somehow influence the the memory, right? Because because of the summation. Does it make sense? Okay. So it's not controlled. I mean, you're basically erasing your whole memory and you know, giving the next input, you just add something. Maybe you, there's a way to control what you write into the memory or, or not. That would be maybe a better solution. So how to provide more controlled memory access? Ah, okay. So we have the memory, now we simplify things. Let me see, let me just see what we have here. Okay, yeah. So we simplify just for the sake of uh, brevity here. We have this vector, memory vector S, and we have an input vector X, and they both are in the same dimensions. Okay, now for the sake of uh, sake of um, uh, explanation here. So they have the same dimension. So we have S, this is the state vector, and we have the input, which is the X vector, just for now. And they have the same dimensions. Okay, so, and so this is D. And let's have a binary vector of the same dimension. So what is binary vector? Well, we have a vector, which is a, the G vector, not to confuse with the nonlinear function, this is just a vector gate, right? The G vector. And this will be somehow maybe zero here, maybe one, maybe zero, maybe zero, maybe one. So this, this is going to be a, an, an example of, the, of, a, of a gate vector, okay? So we can do that, like whatever, vector of zeros or ones. Okay, we have an operation which is called the Hadamard product, which is this very fancy circle symbol. It's a very fancy name for element-wise multiplication. Okay, if you ever see Hadamard product, don't be scared. It's just taking two vectors and multiply them one by one. So if, if we have a vector uh, u and we have a vector v and they match the dimensions, then the result is going to be the first position times the other position. 
and this position times the other. So basically, you know, element vice product, Hadamard <laughs> multiplicate, Hadamard product. So now we're gonna do that the 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 next state. So it's called the S prime here. The next state, we're gonna take. Excuse me. I'm just. Um, let me see. Okay, I'll have it here. So we're gonna take the input and. So what is what is this what is this gate doing? It's zeros and ones. It's it's going to do something. It's a mask. Yeah, we're masking the vector exactly. It's a boolean mask. So if you have any numbers here, if you have a, let's say x is one, a two, four, seven, and eight, and your gate is zero, one, one, zero, and you have this Hadamard product, you're gonna end up with zeroing the zeros and keeping keeping the ones. What is this? This is eight. Oh, no, this is zero because you're zero, okay? So we're basically masking the zeros out. They're gonna be zeros, okay? Everybody's agree with that? Nice, so masking. So we're masking now the input. And now, okay, what is what is one plus G? Uh, okay, one plus G. So the G is again zero and one. So we're in a binary space. So zero, one, one. If you do this is if this is g, then y minus g is going to be what? It's a flip, yeah. We're gonna flip the vector. It's gonna be one, zero, zero, because we operate in, in binary here. Okay. So this is this is basically flipping flipping the bits. So we flip, so we flip the bits and now do the masking for the state. Ah, okay. So it's interesting. What is it doing? This is saying for for the for the gate where the gate is one, take the input, and for the gate is zero, take the state and add them up. I'll have an example on the next slide. So it basically reads the entire entries in X corresponding corresponding to ones, and writes them to the memory. And the remaining locations are taken from the memory. So here I have a full working example, I guess. Okay, let's start here. So this is X. Okay, this is X and this is S. And this is our gate, okay? So we don't know where the gate comes from. It's just an example gate. So one, uh, zero, one, zero is a gate, okay? Here, this is a gate and this is a gate. So let's start here. We take the, we take the input and multiply it by the gate. So what we're, gonna, what we're gonna end up here with is zero, 11 and zero, okay? Everybody knows why? We're masking with the gate, okay. Here's already, so this is already one minus gate because we flip the bits of the gate, right? We get uh, one, zero, one. And now this operation with the state will give me what? Will give me, what do I get here? Yeah. Eight, zero, three. Eight, zero, three. Yes. So as you might see, they're matching basically where I have some numbers here, it's gonna be a zero obviously in the other one and vice versa, okay? So here I'm keeping keeping information from X and here I'm keeping information from the state and they're just two things because I mask them kind of flip in a flip way, okay? So what happens if I sum them up, oops, sorry, sum them up, I'm gonna get eight, 11 and three, okay, this is it. You know why? Now you should understand why. I'm masking one, flip the mask, mask the other and sum them up. So it tells me I'm keeping, okay, so the 11 has been kept from the, from the input and eight and three has been kept from the state. And through the gates, I can exactly, so the gate actually exactly controls what I'm taking from the state and what I'm taking from the input. So it's not like cramming everything as we had here, you know, everything is going to end up in a, everything is going to be taken from the input and everything is going to end up in the state. But maybe I can use this gating mechanism for controlling what's going to be written in the state from the input. That's cool. The question is, where the heck I get this gate? <laughs> right? I mean, this is like, a, where is it coming from? Good question. So maybe we can learn it. So. I mean, this gate is binary. It's hard, like uh, zero, one, excuse me, sec. 
0, 1. We just define them so they're not learnable. These gates are not differentiable, like the hard gate, basically, it's not, you know, it's a, uh, it's not differentiable. It's not a differentiable function. It's just hard kind of uh, step function. So we want to replace these gates, 0, 1, with soft gates. And we're coming to a, um, a very special, very interesting architecture, which is called the long short-term memory, which kind of utilizes the gates to learn something about what to keep in the memory and what not. Okay, so it's going to tie everything up together. So what we need to remember is that the simple RNN is this thing, the simple RNN, just taking the taking this input at step, taking the previous step, do some projection nonlinearity, and that's it. Yeah, but we want to keep, you know, but this is just summing up, summing up uh, input and current state together, but there's no gating. So we need to introduce gates somewhere here, and these gates should be learnable. So let's start with LSTM. OK. So long, short-term memory, LSTM, 1997, I guess. Very famous paper from uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber. And I don't remember the second author, actually, to be honest. Very too famous. I mean, Jürgen Schmidhuber is still like a famous person in deep learning. And the other holds, uh, I think he was an uh, Austrian or German guy. Apologies. So very, very famous architecture, actually. It's been state of the art for decades. So it's designed to solve the vanishing gradient problem. OK, vanishing gradient, we know what it means. So it introduced the gating mechanism here. Now, what is it going to do in particular? It takes this uh, state vector. So the state vector is something we're passing from step to step. And it's going to split it in two halves, exactly. So one half is going to be so-called memory cells. And the other half is going to be a working memory. I don't think you need to remember exactly that, but it's just how they call that for a reason. So the memory cells are designed to preserve the memory and the error gradients across time. And we're going to use the gating components, but there, there will be differentiable. So we'll use some sort of smooth functions that should simulate the logical gates, right? So we don't have like this zero, one step function, but something which is smooth. Ah, what could be a smooth, smooth version of zero, one function? So, uh, okay. So zero, one function, right? I mean, there is a X. Y, there's zero, okay, and it's zero and one. Can we can we do something smoother? Yeah, we can use sigmoid, of course. Sigmoid is going to be very smooth here and like that. So mostly it will be one, mostly it will be zero, and here it's going to be something in between, and it's going to be what? So the difference between this zero, one, like heart, and sigmoid is you can do differentiations of sigmoid. You can compute a gradient of sigmoid. Oh, OK. Why is it cool to have differentiation? You know, why is it cool to have something which looks like a gate, but you can differentiate it? Why is it good? Yeah. Because you can do back propagation on that. You can plug your gate. You kind of say, well, it's a soft, soft uh, gate. But you can plug your soft gate into, into your network because it works with back propagation. It will work. It's a function. You need how to compute the output. You know how to compute a gradient. What is the gradient? What is the gradient of this? Yeah, it's undefined. I mean, here it's zero. It's zero, and here it's undefined. Well, softmax is better. It's mostly one, mostly mostly one here. Excuse me. So zero. It's mostly zero. Gradient of softmax uh, of sigma is mostly zero here, mostly zero here, but it's everything in between. Okay, cool. So we can differentiate. It. Cool. So we're gonna use this gates, but we're gonna replace the, the, the hard gates with uh, with sigmoids, basically. OK. So again, we have the state at time j, and we have these two vectors. So that's what we, why do we call it j now? Why not? OK, this is j. We use the i. Now we're using j. Life is hard. So j is the time step now. And we have uh, two vectors now. So one is the memory component, which we call cj. So it's a vector. 
so CJ. And we have the HJ, which is the hidden state. We call it a hidden state. Why is it hidden? Maybe it's not, it's not hidden. I mean, if you have a network, you can look at look at all these all these matrices, it's not hidden, but it's hidden maybe from the perspective of the network because it's not it's not outputted, maybe. Maybe it is. Anyway, so we have this HJ, which is another vector. Okay, so this is our this is a state. So previously we had a state I, which was one vector. Now we have we have it in two parts and we so sort of split it. Okay, so this is our design design choice. Cool. And at each state, there is a gate, and the gate decides how much of the new input should be written to the memory cell, and how much of the current content of the memory cell should be forgotten. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what we did before. I mean, the gates. So you, there, is, there will be a gate, and the gate will tell me, if you get this input, add it to this memory, and keep, keep the memory on the other positions. So we're basically, the gates will really control this this sj and hj so the memory will uh, sorry the gates will decide do i want to update this one this one i want to keep this one i keep this one i'm going to update but it's going to be in a differential manner so because we're, we're not using zero and one but sigmoid or some other um, maybe sigmoid i guess so yeah okay so the gates. Well, LSTM is kind of complicated, so we have three gates. We're going to use input gate, we're going to use a forget gate, and we're going to use output gate. As you might guess, these input gates will be doing something with the, you know, the things they're kind of named after. So input gate will going to control if I have this input, so it's a vector xj, so what is the input gate going to tell me? Most likely, what is it going to tell me? I'm, if I'm putting gate on this vector, what I'm after gating, what I'm going to end up with? The same vector, sure, but what's going to be there? Maybe something, something will be transferred, like this position will be transferred. So like, let's say two, and it's going to be something like two, and maybe this will be zeroed out. Sorry, this will be maybe three, and this might be zero out. So some things will be kept, and some things will be just forgotten. Not forgotten, sorry, not, not taken from the input. You know, I'm gating the input. I'm just putting a mask on the input and saying, yeah, uh, some things should end up in the after gating, and some things not. Make sense? You're, you're, you're puzzled. We're talking about how much it doesn't necessarily have to be in three, but will zero, but it also be one, or? So, sorry, say again. The gates? If we're deciding how much of the uh, input we want to write to the new one, it could also be that, for example, we have a number like three, we project to one then? Um, yes and no. I mean, so the idea of the gating is that you keep the input the same. But because it's a because it's a sigmoid, it might not be the same exactly the same the exact same number, right? Because the if you have like the hard gates, you know they might be like they, they are only zero zero and ones. The soft gates will be something like and stuff like that because sigmoid is between zero and one. But there, it's zero and one for minus, you know, only for the uh, for the supremum and infimum of that. Okay. So, of course, if you multiply a number by zero 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 point two, it's not going to be zero. It's going to be something very small. So that's the idea. Okay. Uh, so this is the soft gate. Okay. So we have three gates. One is for input, just basically putting a mask on the input. One is forget gate. So it basically saying how much you should, which information you should forget. And output gate is, if you have something, how much, what, what do you want to output in this current state? So there are three gates, okay? They work the same way. There is a gating mechanism, which is almost like zero and one masking, but the masking are soft masks, okay? So let's have a look at the architecture and then we'll finish. All right, so we have this input here again at state J. So this is the this is the embedding vector, okay? So this is the embedding vector coming into the uh, into the network. 
And we said that the memory from the previous state is going to be split into this CJ and hidden, hidden state. So this is memory cell and hidden, hidden cell. These are two vectors, right? So this is where, what we have. At time j, we have the previous two parts. All right. Maybe you, if you see the result, you see this very horrible, you know, this very complicated stuff. But I'm, I have it as you know here as a step by step, so that we understand it. If you look at this LSTM, you just you, you wanna you wanna cry. Don't do it. So, so we take the input and run. Uh, so these Ws are some parameters of the network, which we're gonna learn. Okay, yeah, that's great. So we take the input and do some projection. So this is learn a learn a parameter and take the previous hidden vector, do some projection and sum them up together. And the 10, 10 H, what was 10 H between minus one and one? Was it like that? Okay. So what this 10 H is doing, so this is this is going to be a vector, right? I mean, this is going to be some vector of dimensionality Z. So I believe it's going to be RZ. So this is going to be vector, but after it's 10 H, it's going to be mostly a vector of minus ones and ones. Not, not completely because 10 H is, a, you know, it's minus one for minus infinity and plus one for plus infinity, but we will close to minus one and one. So these are, we call this an update candidate. Okay, so we're gonna we taking the previous state, the current input, and we're gonna say, yeah, uh, give me minus ones and ones, almost. Why are we doing that? Yeah, I don't know. We're gonna find out later. But this is you know we're taking step by step, so we have this update candidate. So good. Uh, so far so good. Okay, so we're just. It's I guess it's important to kind of understand what's not these equations, but what is what could be in there. So almost minus one and almost one. So this will be something which we'll use later. Okay. Then we take, uh, what is this? This is F, is it the forget gate? I guess so, so forget gate. Okay, we take again the input and the previous hidden state. And what are you doing here? So this is going to be again a vector of F size. Right, and after okay, what is this? What is this symbol? This sigma. Okay, yeah, sigmoid. Yeah, this is sigmoid. Okay, so we run a sigmoid on a vector. What we're gonna end up with? Numbers between zero and one. Oh, this is the gate. We're gonna we're gonna take the input and the previous hidden state, combine them together somehow, just project and sum up. And on this vector, we, we're gonna run the sigmoid. And this is the forget gate. So it's gonna tell us, given the current input and the previous output, what should we forget? So it's gonna be 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.001 and stuff like that. So it's going to be the mass. This is the, this is the gate, okay? This is how we compute the gate given the current input and the previous state. All good? Okay. So, I guess this is the forget gate, right? F, let me let me double check. F is the forget gate. Okay, so that's where we learned the, the forget gate. Forget gate. Why is it gate? Because it's just mostly ones or zeros, roughly, because of the sigmoid. But it's approximation of zero and ones. So we have a forget gate. Okay, cool. Let's take another step. Okay, we do something, actually we do the same thing now, and this is the input gate. Again, we take the previous hidden state, we take the input, we just project them and stack them together and run, a, again, a sigmoid. So here the input gate is going to be the same, but maybe a different dimensionality because the i uh, might be different. So it's gonna be, again, a vector of mostly either zeros or ones. So now we've been asking like why, I mean, are these two same or not? Like what is the difference between the I and, and the F? What's the difference between these and these? Because 
Mathematically, they're doing the same thing. Is there any difference? Yeah, they have different parameters, of course. They're using the weights are different. Here we're using parameters uh, XF, so wh whatever, I mean, some other parameters than these. So these parameters are not the same. That's why, and how do you how do you find the parameters? You start randomly. So they will learn something else. These functions will learn something else because they start at a, at different with different parameters from the beginning. So they will end up with different parameters at the end. So they will do something else, okay? But mathematically, and also the dimensionality doesn't have to be the same. So the input gate and or output gate might have different dimensionality. But maybe they have the same, I don't know. But this is just projection. So we're learning, learning here the gates. So far, so good? All right. Next step. Oh, okay. Well, what was that again? The Hadamar product. Okay. So, <laughs> right. We need to do something. So what we're doing here is taking, so this is a mask, right? This is the forget gate. Forget, I call it a mask. I like a mask or a gate. Forget gate. And this is the input gate. So what we're going to do here is take the forget gate and the previous memory cell, and we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna say, yeah, for some things, just copy copy the output, sorry, copy the, the previous one, and some will be mostly zero, right? Because the gate is, remember here, the F gate is either zero or one mostly. So it's gonna be copy pasted some positions and some will be almost zero and some will be taken from the previous one because of the gating mechanism, okay? Make sense? The gating, like this is this is gating, this is the, the product we had the example before. Okay, so this is one part. We're taking the forget gate, but then we're taking the input gate, and again, the input gate is just uh, ones or zeros mostly here. And, okay, and we have this candidate here. Why are Why the heck are we doing this? Yeah, this was like minus one and plus one. Okay, strange, but why not? So here we are combining the input gate with the with the candidate here. So it's gonna be either minus one or plus one or zero. Interesting. I never thought about it to be honest, but it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. Okay, I'll, I need to finish soon. Anyway, so we're stitching them together and add them to the memory cell and producing memory cell. Okay, I don't know how they came up with this, to be honest. I mean, it's a maybe there's an explanation in the paper why they do ex exactly that operation or not. Why is it so complicated? I, I don't know why this, this candidate is here, to be honest. But maybe there's a reason. I, I never studied it in such a depth. So you end up with a new, new, uh, new memory cell. Oh, okay, there's an output gate. Okay, we'll, we'll finishing. Output gate. Output gate is um, the same as before as the other gate. So it takes the current input and the previous hidden state and just creates something again like a zero or ones. Okay, so the output, output gate is again learned as a projection. Now, we create a new hidden state by taking the previous memory cell and run tan h, uh, tan h on that. So again, minus one or plus one and take the output state. Okay, so it's gonna be um, this gating mechanism on the tan h of the, previous, uh, of the previous memory cell. So it's gonna end up here. Okay, that's interesting. So we're gonna, we're gonna end up here is this uh, hidden state. Now the question is, what's the output? Oh, basically the output is again in, in the simple RNN. So the output is basically the hidden state. So we're outputting the hidden state in each in each time step. So it's not hidden anymore. So the, I don't know why it's called hidden. It's a output state in each one. Okay, so we're we're outputting the the thing, and I guess that's it. Yeah, that's it actually. It's not that complicated. It's three gates, this very weird candidate state, and just updating the you know gating the the memory cell, having all these information here. The thing is, we can learn this everything with backpropagation because these gates are soft. This is like softmax. 10H is also differentiable. And everything else are just functions where you can find a partial derivative. So it's everything is learnable. It looks just super complicated. So 
of course, now we have parameters uh, and dimensions and stuff like that. I'm not going to spend too much time on that because this is just, you need to pay attention to that when you do that. And of course, you can use LSTM. So remember, we have these R and O. Now you, we say, well, it's an LSTM cell because what you need really to know is the previous state, current input, and it's going to produce the next state. So we can replace this R and O function with this so-called LSTM, LSTM state. And we even already bias term. Okay, so we can stack them, stack this as a actual implementation of these of these function in this RNN. Okay, and it will work. It will be like a huge computational graph, but it will work because everything works. Everything is differentiable. You can run backpropagation. You can train it with stochastic gradient descent. Awesome. Recap. So RNNs are great for arbitrary long input because you can encode the entire sequence and each step as well. You can do two directions, bidirection RNNs is a thing. And LSTM is a particular powerful RNN because they, they use this gating. So you exactly say what you need to remember from the previous state and you have this like a, a long sort of highway or memory and you control how you work with the memory. Okay, any questions? Great. The good, the good thing is you don't have to implement from scratch because if you use PyTorch, there is like LSTM <laughs> and, 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 and that's it. You don't, have to learn, you don't have to implement LSTM from scratch. Maybe it could be a nice exercise. I, I personally never done it. I just used uh, like out of box LSTM because it's, if it's there, you don't have to run with the wheel. All right. If you have no questions, so thanks a lot and I'll see you next week. <laughs>